Uh, I want to start with you, uh, Dr. Kaur, uh, and I would request other uh, esteemed panelists to switch on the cameras as well. Um, Dr. Kaur, uh, what do you think is the demographic distribution of cancer-related uh, ailments in India, and which cancer is predominant in which demography? Good afternoon. Thank you for having me on. I managed to catch a few minutes of the previous discussion and it was quite invigorating. So I hope during this session also we'll, uh, we'll get to bring up important points because cancer is the biggest scourge right now, um, especially in India. And when we talk of, um, you know, the distribution of cancer and the demographics of cancer, uh, first of all, if we look at what are the commonest cancers that we see in India, so it's um, lung, breast, oral cancer, esophageal cancer. And amongst women, we know that breast has overtaken cervical cancer as the commonest um, cancer amongst women, especially in metropolitan um, cities. And lung cancer continues to be the number one cancer amongst men. Um, distribution of cancer, we know, uh, depending on the type of cancer we are looking at, you know, like Northeast has the highest number of cancers, especially oral cancers. Um, uh, and uh, Aizwal actually has the highest number of, of cancers in the country. So if you look at the demographic distribution of cancer overall in India, um, we see that oral cancer, especially amongst the tobacco chewers um, and the use of tobacco is, is on the rise along with lung cancer and breast mainly amongst women. In India and which cancer is predominant in which demography? Yeah, if you see, uh, 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 we see almost like 13 lakh cancers uh, annually in our country, of which we are almost seeing 8 lakh uh, cancer deaths. And uh, based on the population-based cancer registries, uh, uh, India has been divided into six geographic regions. So North, South, East, West, Central, and the Northeast. And if you see based on these geographic regions, we see that in the North and Northeast, the incidence of cancers is very high. So as told by uh, Ms. Kaur, uh, the, the incidence is very high in uh, uh, Meghalaya, Mizoram, and Arunachal Pradesh, where we see a lot of uh, oral oropharyngeal, esophagus, GAT, and uh, breast cancers. So if we see a lot of uh, rise in the incidence of breast cancers, especially in metropolitan cities, uh, but uh, even in rural uh, India, the incidence of breast cancer is increasing and uh, it has surpassed the cervical cancers. Uh, if you see in Kerala, there is an incidence uh, in the thyroid cancers have been noted in the high incidence in Kerala. And a high incidence of uh, gallbladder cancers and uh, uh, upper GA cancers uh, with high incidence in the north. So uh, there is a wide distribution in heterogeneity in uh, these distribution, demographic distribution of cancers. And it estimated that we are about to encounter close to 30 million cancer cases by 2025, which is very alarming. I can totally, totally uh, understand. You know, uh, Dr. Rajendra uh, uh, is here with us. Um, uh, so, if you can hear me. So, my first question, I'm on my first question, which was, uh, what do you think is the demographic distribution of cancer-related ailments in India, which, uh, you know, uh, which are predominant in which areas, according to you? So, I belong to uh, Uttar Pradesh, UP state, and uh, uh, in this state, along the belt of uh, Gangaji and uh, then uh, other rivers, so there are most of the, uh, of these, uh, uh, commercial waste, you can say uh, industrial waste uh, that is uh, sent to the um, these rivers. So most of the GI cancers, gallbladder cancer and liver cancer, they are the most common in these uh, areas. Similarly, if you see the uh, this Kashmiri part, Srinagar part, so these people they consume a lot of uh, spices. So there also we see a lot of GI cancers. Uh, intestinal cancer, stomach cancer. Similar is in the southern Indian part where people take a lot of spices uh, in their meal. As uh, you go to these states like Bihar, uh, poor people, they used to uh, chew penny and uh, you see a lot of head and neck cancers uh, coming from Bihar belt. So these are the demographic variations uh, which we see in our country. Uh, Dr. Kaur, uh... Is there a correlation between the gender and mortality rate? If yes, then in what age group does it cause more mortality? We do 
about a disparity in um, you know the mortality uh, with regards to gender now whether these are more strongly related to the etiology of the cancer rather than the prognosis that depends from cancer to cancer um, you know as a general rule we know that um, older the patient above 80 or above 70s then obviously um, the the mortality from the cancer is more part of it also which is contributed by treatments because patients who are older are likely to suffer from more severe complications of sacral therapy or uh, the anesthesia which we give for surgery and things like that uh, but we do know uh, you know if you look at data they talk about mortality in uh, much higher than that in women now um, a lot of times it could be because of risk factors like smoking and alcohol consumption which are more prevalent amongst males as compared to uh, females. So these are lifestyle choices that we see and they could contribute to more disease burden, disease getting detected late because of, um, you know, the behavioral things. So women may be more conscious of their health, although uh, this is more of a Western kind of a perspective, because in India, we know that women are likely to put their health uh, on the back burner. And I'll give a little example of breast cancer with regards to this. Because in the West, women are more active and get screening done regularly. Breast cancer is detected at a very early age. Whereas the commonest cancer amongst men, which is lung cancer, you don't have screening for that, right? So it is not likely to be picked up as early. Breast cancer is likely to be picked up. But sadly in India, because women don't undergo screening, a higher mortality rate, in fact, one in two women diagnosed with breast cancer in India are likely to lose their life to breast cancer, as opposed to only, say, 20% or 30% in the Western world. So the attitude of um, the, 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 you know, which is gender guided, uh, health related, uh, lifestyle related, um, does affect the stage at which the cancer is picked and how the how the patient actually responds uh, to treatment. But we do know that in certain cancers, like in lung and uh, bronchial cancer, women are likely to have a better survival outcome when matched stage for stage studies have shown that. Whereas in bladder cancer, uh, women are more likely to have more mortality as compared to men. Now, this could also be because of physician bias, because a man with any early urinary symptoms is more likely to be referred on to cystoscopy than women who generally you know, suffer more from, say, urinary infections. So the threshold of the doctor to refer to cystoscopy might be higher as opposed to a man. So these, there's a very complex interplay of factors and you cannot, um, you know, it's not very black and white that men are more likely to die from cancer and women are less likely. But overall studies do show that men might not uh, do as well in some cancers as compared to women. Point. Uh, Dr. Dr. Reddy, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I agree with the same. Uh, men are supposed to have a higher mortality if you see a lot of studies. But as the incidence is supposed to be high in uh, women because of a lot of breast and cervix cancers. But uh, the, as the tobacco-related cancers take a toll in our country, probably that is the reason why the deaths are more in uh, men. And uh, because of screening facilities, uh, as we see in our country, we have a proper screening facilities for breast and uh, cervix when compared to oral and lung in men. So that may be one of the reasons where more and more Cancers are diagnosed in women, and uh, but the mortality rates are more in uh, men. We're talking about, you know, our, our question was, is there a correlation between the gender and mortality rate? So I don't think it is uh, true directly to the gender. It is basically the type of cancer and uh, the stage of cancer which matters. But uh, absolutely, uh, it's not like uh, a female with early stage, say, breast cancer, will have higher mortality, it is not true. But type of cancer with the advanced stage is obviously, uh, irrespective of gender, causes higher mortality. Uh, Dr. Kaur, you know, uh, uh, we all want to know uh, what are the key factors that increase the cancer risk amongst the working population? When we talk about cancers, you know, there is always this discussion on um, occupational um, uh, risks associated with cancer or, or the risks of cancer in the working population. Now, this can be broadly divided under two headings. One is 
occupational exposure to carcinogens. Are you being exposed to chemicals that lead to an increased risk of cancer? That is one aspect of it. The other is your lifestyle due to your occupation, because we know that most cancers are lifestyle risk associated, right? So when we talk about occupational exposure to, um, to chemicals, so people who work in factories where there's arsenic, cadmium, ethanol, um, uh, you know, workers who are working on the roads, constantly being exposed to smoke. Uh, so those are the kind of people we know who will be directly have a carcinogenic effect of the chemicals that they are exposed to and I think with the Industries Act now that is um, that is very strictly regulated a little example also of doctors who work in the hospitals who work around machines that have radiation exposure for them they are mandated to wear something called TLD batches which calculate the amount of radiation that the doctor has received you know which could pose health risk so so that is an aspect that may be controllable and understandable to certain extents. But it's the lifestyle changes which are sometimes more difficult to control. So, you know, I'll give you a very simple example of something. So, you know, we know somebody who's working in the city has, has say, a 12-hour or a 10-hour working day. Um, are they getting enough sleep? Are they having the right kind of food at the right time? Do they have a sedentary work? you know, where, where they're sitting in front of a computer for seven, eight, nine hours at stretch, what are their exercise levels. So, you know, all these things contribute to things like obesity and stress and all of which we know are interlinked as part of the multifactorial reasons for cancer. In fact, there was this very, very interesting case in the UK where a nurse took the NHS to court because she was on night duties for a long time and there is some correlation between, uh, you know, a disruption, what is called your circadian rhythm, don't get enough sleep in the night that alters your hormonal milieu and can lead to an increased risk of development of, say, breast cancer. So um, occupational factors definitely pose a, a risk of cancer um, and they have to be understood in the broad spectrum of what I have discussed. And I also know that now corporates are actively looking at healthy lifestyle for their employees where regular health checks are done, regular health talks are done so that, you know, people are more and more aware about the risk that sometimes even a simple sitting on a chair for eight hours can pose. So, so you know, that is how occupational hazards are associated with cancer risk. We all know that uh, these uh, physical agents in the form of uh, pollutants, uh, there's arsenic, uh, asbestos, silica and cadmium, all these are potential carcinogens and as we all know, the smoke which contains a lot of uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons as the main cause of lung cancer and the radiation hazard is well, very well known. Apart from this, even biologic agents, uh, especially for healthcare workers where there is a risk of contamination from the infected body fluids, especially by the housekeeping staff, in the laboratory, technicians who may get exposed to ethylene oxide, formaldehyde, these are very small things, but they may go a long way if a proper protection hazard, I mean, protection gear is not followed. So, uh, potentially speaking, uh, there is a lot of risk, uh, which is uh, probably previously underestimated for healthcare workers. And uh, it is time that all healthcare workers should take care of a proper sleep patterns, proper diet patterns, so that the hormonal milieu in the body is maintained, which may actually have a long-term effect on the cancer. So the study which was done on the breast cancers uh, regarding the stress and long hours and night shifts has shown some correlation. Though it is not directly causative, it is time to think that uh, uh, we have further studies and take care of these uh, changes in uh, shift timings, especially because uh, we, we are facing a, a, a high rampant increase in breast cancers. Dr. Kaur, uh, do you think uh, micronutrient intake and proper vaccination steps can prevent uh, cancer at an early stage? Does it help prevent cancer as well in the long run? Two components of your question again. One is vaccination and the other is micronutrient intake. Um, I'll talk about micronutrients first. You know, we as a, a generation are sadly encased in these food fads. 
about suddenly one day micronutrients become the holy grail of preventing disease and another day less carbohydrates and another day more protein. And I think nothing harms the body more than not understanding that we need to have a balanced diet. And if you are having a balanced diet, then micronutrients form a part of your diet. So if we look at our traditional Indian diet, if you are having your wheat, your rice with a vegetable, with yogurt, with salad, that is the healthiest form of meal to have, which takes care of all your micronutrients. Nowadays, you see these fads about, um, you know, they, they give microgreens and, and all sorts of things to be included in diet. But I will honestly tell you that for a healthy person, if you follow the lifestyle advice that your grandmother had and understood seasonal variations of food and eating what is native to your culture and your country, then most of the problems are sorted. We do know certain micronutrients like selenium and vitamin D uh, have been linked to breast cancer and other cancers. But we also know that when you put an information like this out in the community, people start overdosing on supplements of selenium and vitamin D, which is actually detrimental rather than being helpful. So it is very, very important to understand to not to get involved in the food. Please put not to get involved in the fad in the food fads that we are you know nowadays um, sadly getting involved in having had said that um, you know i think even as cancer doctors who practice allopathy sadly uh, we talk about our medicines but we we also need to understand dietary influences uh, more and more to be able to guide our patients better uh, into recovery from treatments of cancer and also hopefully reducing risks of further cancers developing so that's the nutrient bit now coming on to the vaccination bit um, vaccination which is the most successful for preventing cancer is that the cervical cancer vaccine, which ideally should be given before the first sexual exposure. And that is why girls as young as nine and 10 are told to take the cervical cancer vaccine. So that definitely reduces the risk significantly of developing cervical cancer. Um, but for other cancers, there are no definite vaccines available, which will reduce the risk of um, you know, developing that cancer. When we are talking of risk reduction in patients who are proven to be genetic carriers, mutation carriers, there are other ways of risk reduction, not vaccines, but there are surgical and medical ways of risk reduction. But for vaccination, uh, mainly for cervical cancer, that is where vaccination plays a role in reducing the risk of developing cancer. Uh, Dr. Reddy, uh, your thoughts on, uh, you know, uh, micronutrient intake and proper vaccination to prevent cancer? Yeah, actually, there are a lot of uh, formulations which are being advocated every day, like combinations of several vitamins, several minerals, several antioxidants, including like curcumin and uh, so many things which are actually available in our food. So what is important to understand by everybody is that uh, a balanced diet at proper time in and uh, having an adequate sleep. So meeting uh, recommended daily allowance of all these nutrients, especially like uh, having fresh fruits and vegetables and uh, including all types of white set that uh, like greens, yellows and reds. Having a colorful diet with uh, having adequate quantity of fresh fruits and vegetables is very important. So if we have a balanced diet, we definitely will meet the required dietary allowance and there is no need to take all these formulations. But this unnecessary propagation of use of micronutrients and antioxidants in the form of drug formulations will not be needed if we take a proper diet. And regarding vaccines, actually, there are the, uh, the hepatitis B and uh, human papillomavirus. These two vaccines uh, are already in use and they have uh, documented in several studies that hepatitis B vaccine is almost like uh, uh, cuts down the risk of chronic hepatitis B infection to more than 90%, thereby preventing the chance of hepatitis carcinoma. And uh, at the same time, human papillomavirus uh, vaccine decreases chances of cervical interrupt in neoplasia as well as carcinoma cervix. And these two have already been uh, included in the national immunization program of several countries. And uh, 
research is going on to study cancer vaccines for other cancers too and uh, hope we see that uh, we have other vaccines too for other cancer forms. Hey, Dr. Dr. Rajan, yes. Uh, good to have you here again with us. Uh, uh, so, so give me a sense of this connect between micronutrient uh, proper vaccination in order to prevent cancer. So I fully agree with the opinion of Dr. Reddy and Dr. Kaur. Uh, we should take a balanced diet. We should focus on a regular exercise, maybe 20-30 minutes. We should do uh, some kind of meditation. We should give uh, as possible as uh, uh, we can do relaxation to our body during our stressful working environment. And if you are taking a balanced diet, uh, you are taking proper vegetable, fruits, carbohydrates, I think additional micronutrients are not required, which uh, Dr. Kaur discussed. So coming to vaccination, uh, I agree with Dr. Reddy. Uh, so we should uh, encourage as much possible vaccination to younger girls for uh, this uh, cervical cancer and for hepatitis B and C. So till date, uh, these are the two vaccinations which are uh, preventive and other are under investigations. Uh, Dr. Kaur, um, you know, uh, I asked this question earlier in the panel, but very relevant one about the correlation between genetics and cancer risk among population. Uh, if one has a family history of cancer, uh, what is the possibility of having uh, cancer, you know, uh, yeah, by the future generations? Uh, you know, um, the general belief in the public is that uh, if nobody in my family had cancer, I will not get cancer. But the statistics right. tell us that only 5 to 10% cancers have are inherited or have a strong family history risk. And even in them, we are able to identify the mutated gene in probably 15 to 20% cases. Okay. So yes, family history does pose an increased risk of developing cancers especially for cancers like breast cancer and ovarian cancer. There are certain cancers like lung cancers, which are primarily or oral cancer, which are lifestyle risk associated. Then there are certain cancers that we know which fall under hereditary cancer syndromes, where the patient is at a risk of developing multiple cancers in different parts of the body. Now, what is important is that if somebody has a family history of breast cancer, which is strong, they should definitely visit a cancer clinic where the doctor can guide them about genetic counseling. Now, I'll tell you one sad story about, sadly, in India, what happens is that the moment you, you know that there is a genetic test available which can find out whether you have a risk of cancer, Sadly, these tests are available in the market even without proper genetic counseling. And getting these tests done without the guidance of a genetic counselor can call open a Pandora's box. So it is very important to understand that if you have a strong family history of any type of cancer, then you must visit the cancer clinic, talk to your oncologist, talk to the genetic counselor and understand if certain genetic tests can be done to identify the mutated gene which can lead to that cancer. And before you have such a test, you must have a discussion about what will be the action taken once that test is done. Because sometimes patients get this test done and oops, it comes back as positive. And then they are not ready to discuss options like, I'll give an example of say, if the gene called BRCA1 and 2, if that comes positive, you're at a higher risk of developing breast cancer or ovarian cancer. And it is obviously for a healthy female to tell her that you need to remove your breasts and your ovaries to reduce your lifetime risk of developing cancer is a very, very big decision. So all this discussion must be had before the test is recommended and done. Sometimes in some cancers, like in breast cancer, there may be no family history, but we have certain guidelines about certain types of forms of breast cancer in younger women, where we will still do genetic testing to understand whether they have a mutation that led them to develop this cancer. And then we can counsel their family accordingly. Having a genetic mutation does not lead to a 100% risk of developing the cancer. It does increase the risk to 80 to 85% lifetime risk. 
and doing surgical risk reduction like angelina jolie did for her breasts and ovaries reduces that from 85% to less than 5% so that is how we counsel patients and i'll tell you this is the most difficult discussion in clinic in fact only yesterday i was talking to a patient who is breca positive and she was telling me ki aapne mera ye test kyu karaya ab life long i am going to be worried that i will develop uh, cancer in the other breast and in the ovaries i did not want to know i do not want to get my daughter tested so you know you don't want to be in that kind of scenario after the test is done so these tests have to be done very sensibly after discussion with the genetic counselor understanding the family tree of cancers and also understanding like sometimes if somebody has breast cancer they may also have other cancers in the family so just doing a breca1 breca2 may not be enough they may need what is called multi gene testing and that is why a genetic counselor is the best person to have this discussion No, absolutely i think it's also about uh, dealing with that uh, trauma and finding ways to you know help patients deal with it of course uh, under my, my expert advice uh, dr reddy uh, your thoughts on this interplay between genetics and the risk among uh, you know risk of getting cancer yeah i would like to add something sir so as rightly said by dr kaur uh, there is something like we have a genetic testing and if a genetic test come positive uh, most patients become panic that that they're definitely going to get a cancer so it's very important to counsel that is a part of genetic counseling where it is important to counsel that it is not uh, a definite uh, 100% incidence of breast cancer and uh, there is an option of a risk reduction surgery so in routine practice what we see are two sets of patients one are with too much of fear and too much of neglect patients who are with too much of neglect they don't come forward for a uh, gene testing even after counseling and patients who are with too much of fear uh, they are actually, actually they want the surgery in fact there are patients who are coming to me at, at that uh, stage where angelina jolie had a risk reduction surgery even without any genetic risk even without gene testing they were asked to that to ask uh, for the both the breast to be removed so here we are encountering uh, like uh, two extremes which is not correct and uh, the thought should be in in between and a balanced way and the patients have to be counseled in a proper way and uh, definitely these risk reduction surgeries in the form of bilateral prophylactic mastectomy bilateral salping oophorectomy and in case of lynch syndromes like prophylactic uh, oophorectomy and uh, as we see in hereditary non, uh, non polyposis colon cancer in familial adenomatous polyposis prophylactic total pro uh, proctocolectomy and in red proton which in uh, positive uh, thyroid cancers especially medullary thyroid cancer is a part of men syndromes we go for a prophylactic thyroidectomy all these are prophylactic cancer surgeries which are done in gene positive and risk where the risk is high so this risk assessment is done after a genetic testing and by certain uh, computer aided algorithms where it is calculated based on for example in breast where the gail risk model uh, and claus risk model uh, assesses the risk the lifetime risk to more than 20% we are ca positive and multiple uh, members in the family first generation second generation they are positive so they are assessed by several criteria and then they be opt for a risk reduction surgery it is not just like that we have a family member positive and then we are definitely going to get the cancer so that is very important to educate the patients and then they have to take it in a proper way uh, radiation is said to be a major uh, contributing factor in uh, increased uh, cancer risk uh, do you think use of radiation as a treatment increases the risk of developing other cancers so if you uh, if i handle your first comment that uh, radiation increases the risk of cancer it's true we have seen that after world war hiroshima and nagasaki event there was huge uh, increase in number of cancers uh, there in next 20 30 40 years but if you see the modern uh, radiation techniques used since the last 20 30 40 years where you gave targeted radiations to the tumor only and now we don't use much of the uh, radioactive cobalt source in our external radiation we use x ray based uh, radiation therapy these uh, machines which are modern linear accelerators which uh, uses these modern x rays so uh, risk of uh, second malignancy after say 20 30 years is very marginal if you see the actual incidence of cancer and if you see second malignancy in a patient treated by radiation 
is not uh, much of the uh, higher value so they they are almost yeah. the similar uh, risk what happens once a patient got uh, cancer first time so there are few uh, changes few lifestyle or you can say working environment related or is habitual that he is prone to have second type of malignancy as we say in head and neck cancers so once a patient had first time head and neck cancer treated by surgery or or maybe radiation he or she is tend to have second malignancy and it is known as a field cancerization but yes uh, theoretically speaking radiation uh, causes little higher risk as compared to a population which has not been exposed to radiation uh, dr kor uh, has covid 19 as a pandemic also contributed in increasing the cancer risks how much and in what intensity has covid-19 triggered the cancer you know no kind of been a trigger as far as prevalence of cancer is concerned i think our generation and for many generations to come can blame covid for everything wrong that went <laughs> with the society um so covid uh, came in 2020 in two or three years you cannot talk Uh, or even look at uh, increased prevalence of cancer related to covid okay but what we uh, do know covid did um, sadly um, it led to patients not coming in time to seek timely treatments in in a country like india where already patients most of them come in stage 3 and 4 after being diagnosed diagnosed uh, you know for diagnosis um we did notice in clinic and i'm sure all doctors did that patients are coming once the covid pandemic slightly settled a bit patients came saying they felt the lump a year and a half ago in their breast but they were too scared to come to hospital so they've come now so yes there will be a stage shift not change in prevalence but a stage shift so a patient who could have had been detected early is being detected late because they were too scared to come to hospital so that was one aspect the second aspect was treatment related we do know a lot of hospitals and this data came from the west where a lot of uh, hospitals and centers that were offering screening services for say breast cancer shut down their screening services for the time when hospitals became overwhelmed with covid patients and that has led to a stage shift in cancer being detected in in those cultures in those countries as well also because of covid if somebody say had covid infection and developed lung issues then the optimum chemotherapy that could have or would have been recommended to them may need to be uh, modulated and they may not be able to get the definite treatment uh, that they would have had received had they not been infected with covid and also during chemo if a patient was tested positive for covid even if they were asymptomatic their treatments were pushed back by two or three weeks so we will only in the next few years understand the full impact that covid has had on the cancer world uh, cancer world but definitely um, you know prevalence uh, will not change it is when the patient presented at what stage and whether we were able to optimize their treatments that is what is the main issue with covid infection and cancer Uh, Dr. Reddy, uh, your thoughts on this? Yeah, if you are talk, uh, that, talking about uh, the cause of uh, cancer by COVID, nobody can really say right now because uh, the, uh, nobody knows about the disease per se for uh, several years, and uh, it took several years for actually finding out uh, some sort of treatment. And uh, we don't know about what uh, what changes in the microvasculature, the changes in the lungs, the fibrotic changes in the lungs, the changes in the pancreas. all uh, uh, may cause some problems in the future but we cannot uh, directly comment right now that it may be one of the cause of cancer but yes definitely it has increased the gap in the care uh, problems in screening problems in uh, palliative care problems in access and uh, as you know a lot of hospitals even oncology hospitals were turned to covid centers to take care of uh, these patients in need and uh, there is shortage of oncology personnel also though we all actually were taking care of uh, oncology patients patients in fear they were not coming forward and that is the reason why uh, after the main 
like uh, lockdowns have uh, come apart we were seeing more patients at the higher stages and uh, even to cater the services to these patients there were some changes in the protocols like uh, to give like uh, hormone in your joint hormone therapy for breast cancers to prevent uh, additional risk if you are going for surgery especially in elderly women at the same time some new joint radiation in a in a patient who is bound to have a surgical risk as it was documented that uh, surgery has an additional risk if we go uh, ahead and that patient has covid in the perioperative period so yes there were definitely a lot of uh, challenges and um, uh, the patients had lot of trouble and now we are seeing lot of patients who are coming uh, forward uh, who, who actually might have cancer at that time but coming for treatment now so there is a lot of cancer burden there is a uh, gap in the screening and uh, gap in the care probably uh, things are better now and then uh, we are able to take care of the patients in a better way thank you gentlemen i mean we are out of time i really had some more questions but uh, unfortunately uh, you know we, we just have to you know stick by the timing uh, but thank you uh, dr kaur uh, dr reddy uh, uh, and dr kumar uh, you know for joining us um, and taking out time to share your thoughts